good morning everyone uh, it's a great pleasure to kind of welcome you all for uh, today's uh, cancer early detection seminar series and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker uh, dr uh, gavin m brindley uh, dr gavin m brindley is a professor of biomedical magnetic resonance at uh, university of cambridge and he is also a senior group leader at cancer research uk cambridge and dr uh, brindley received his ba degree from uh, university of oxford in 1978 followed by d phil uh, doctor of philosophy in 1982 from the same university and dr brindley received or uh, elected as a royal society university research fellow in 1986 later he joined as a lecturer in manchester in 1990 followed by 1993 he joined as a lecturer in cambridge where he is currently a professor since uh, 2005. And uh, he was an elected fellow of Academy of Medical Sciences in 2012 and the European Academy of Cancer Sciences in 2014. And in 2020, he was elected as a fellow of International Society of Magnetic Resonance and fellow of the Royal Society. He received two fellow awards. And he's also like a kind of a president of European Society of Molecular Imaging in 2018. And he received European Society of Molecular Imaging Award in 2013 and gold medal of the World Molecular Imaging Society in 2014. With that introduction, I just want to in, uh, invite Dr. Brindley to give his talk on imaging tumor metabolism from mouse to man. Uh, I welcome you, Dr. Brindley. Yeah. Thanks very much for that introduction. If I can just find my um, slides. Can you see that okay? Yes, we do. Good, great, thanks. Well, thanks for inviting me to give a talk. Um, I don't really work in early detection uh, other than the early detection of, of treatment response was been the focus of my research for, for some years now. Actually, really, since I've been in, in, in Cambridge. Um, actually, if I can just stop this a second. That's better. Um, yeah, so my the focus has really been the very early evidence of treatment response with the idea that you could use this to guide treatment in individual patients. And the, the main focus of my research in the, in the last uh, 25 years or so has been to image tumor metabolism. And I'm going to tell you a, a few stories about how we've progressed some of this work from uh, from mouse in, into into man. Um, by way of introduction, I, 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 I'm not sure how expert the audience is, but I'll just give you a bit of background of how we can use magnetic resonance to look at tissue metabolism. Uh, I mean, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with MRI studies where you image tissue water protons, which of course are very abundant. Proton is very sensitive to detection. So we can generate relatively high resolution images of tissue anatomy. But we've actually known since the 1970s that we can also detect small molecule metabolites present in tissue. So for example, the, these are spectra acquired from this region of the brain, this white box. Th these are not our data, by the way, I think it's from Rolf Grutter's lab. And what you can see here are signals from various intracellular metabolites, choline, creatine, and acetyl aspartate, for example. Um, but we can't image these except at relatively low resolution. And, and the reason for that, of course, is that these metabolites are present in millimolar concentrations instead of tens of molar in the case of, of water. Moreover, if we look at uh, often in, in metabolism, we're looking at a steady state unless we're looking at transitions between two states, for example. And if you want to understand, if you want to look at metabolic fluxes in a metabolic steady state, then you need to introduce an isotope label. And in magnetic resonance, that's primarily been using carbon-13 or carbon-13 labeled metabolites. This is work from Bob Shulman's lab at Yale. Uh, Shulman was a pioneer of using carbon-13 to study tissue metabolism in vivo. This is, a, a, as you can see, a very old example where they introduced carbon-13 labeled uh, substrate. I think it was ethanol in this case. And you can see uh, signals from various labeled metabolites. So you can see which carbon in, in the uh, metabolite is labeled. And if you acquire a series of spectra over time, you can measure metabolic fluxes in specific pathways. Um, th there's no imaging because the sensitivity of, of detection is, of the carbon-13 is so low and, and the uh, temporal resolution is also really quite poor. And that just reflects the insensitivity of the technique. Uh, 
Nevertheless, they did take this technique into the clinic in the early 90s, where they, in this example, they infused a patient with carbon-13 labeled glucose and then looked at labeling of muscle glycogen. And so they could measure uh, uh, glycogen synthesis rates in a patient in vivo. But again, no imaging because there's not enough sensitivity. And again, uh, temporal resolution is also relatively poor. Since 2006, uh, we've been using this technique, um, uh, uh, new, uh, dynamic nuclear polarization, which increases the sensitivity in the NMR experiment by more than 10,000 fold. And for the non-NMR people, I'll just very briefly explain how this technique works. So if we look at a spinner half nucleus like proton or carbon-13, there are two allowed energy levels, and we can think of that as spins aligned with the field, that's lower energy level, and spins aligned against the field, that's the higher energy level. And it's this population difference which gives rise to signal in the NMR experiment. And that, this population difference is given by this Boltzmann distribution. And the conventional way that we've gone about increasing sensitivity in the NMR experiment is to build higher field magnets, increase this delta E term, the difference in energy between these two energy levels, increases the population difference and we get more signal. Um, we can also increase the signal by lowering the temperature. The problem with that is you have to get to almost absolute zero before you get substantial spin polarization. Now you can play a trick, and this trick was suggested by this man, Albert Overhauser, in the 1950s in his PhD thesis. And what he suggested, and it was, it was soon shown to be experimentally to be the case, if you take a, a stable radical, this is a tritile radical, an electron spin. Now the electron spin is much, much larger. Uh, the magnetic moment is much larger than for the nuclear spin. Now if we put this electron spin into a, a relatively high magnetic field at low temperature, we'll get complete polarization of those electron spins. Now what o Overhauser suggested was you could irradiate this electron spin resonance and transfer polarization from the electron into the co-mixed frozen sample containing carbon-13 into the carbon-13 nuclei. Well, that's all very, and you can substantially polarize those nuclear spins in this way, but that's all very well, but you're now working at one degree Kelvin. Now, what these two guys realized, uh, Jan Hendrik Adnikar Larsen and Clay Skolman, who were working for Amersham at the time in Malmo in Sweden, they realized that you could rapidly warm the sample up to room temperature and with substantial retention of this spin polarization. Essentially, so you put your mix, your radical and carbon-13 label molecule, cool the temperature to one degree, uh, to about 1.2 degrees Kelvin, polarize uh, by irradiating the electron spins and then rapidly warm the sample up, basically by uh, blasting superheated water at the sample and blow it out with substantial retention of that spin polarization. And this is what it means experimentally. This is, this is from their paper published in, in PNAS in 2003. This is a carbon-13 label molecule just put into a magnet, it took 65 hours to acquire the spectrum. If you pre-polarize the spins in this device, you can get this spectrum in less than a second. So a fabulous gain in sensitivity. And that's a technique that we've been working with ever, ever since. I'll talk about another imaging technique, a metabolic imaging technique at the end of uh, this, this talk. So the molecule that we and many other people started with is this molecule, pyruvate, which is at the end of the glycolytic pathway, carbon-13 labeled in the carboxyl group. And we put the label there because it has long polarization lifetime. Now, if you inject this hyperpolarized C13 labeled pyruvate in vivo in a tumor bearing mouse, it will exchange its label with the endogenous lactate pool, which is high in tumors. So tumors tend to light up. And you can see that in these, uh, this video here. So the grayscale image is tissue water protons. The tumor is here at the top. We've injected hyperpolarized pyruvate. So this false color image is an image of the pyruvate. So it appears first in the aorta, and then you can see subsequently appears in the tumor. And if you look at the corresponding lactate signal, you can see that lactate is labeled in predominantly in the tumor. And that distribution of lactate in the tumor is also quite heterogeneous. Um, we and others have messed around with lots of different imaging uh, methods to improve sensitivity. So we, we've tended in my lab to focus, you know, I'm not saying this is the best way of doing it, but tended to focus on single shot techniques using spatial spectral pulses and then acquiring the data uh, as a series of, of echoes. And we can generate image resolution, nominal image resolution of about two millimeter uh, isotropic uh, 
And you can see again, you see pyruvate appear in the aorta. These are pyruvate images at the top here. Um, there's the pyruvate. And then these are the corresponding lactate images. And you can see lactate labeled lactate distribution in the tumor is quite heterogeneous. I just 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 talk about a couple of technical things, and this is really for the NMR aficionados um, listening. Um, we did we although we get this fabulous gain in sensitivity, as always in magnetic resonance, you always want a bit more signal. It's never quite sensitive enough. And one way we tried to do that was to transfer polarization from the carbon thirteen into spin coupled protons. You get a gain in uh, potentially a gain in sensitivity because the proton has a bigger magnetic moment, it processes faster than carbon, and that translates into more signal uh, in, in, your, in, in, in your detector coil. Of course, you lose a lot of polarization in, in this transfer, so that's the, the downside, especially in this case, because the coupling constant is so small. Nevertheless, we were able to get this experiment to work in vivo, and that's actually shown here. This is proton-detected carbon-13, hyperpolarized C13 labeled lactate. You don't polarize the protons directly because they have a very short T1, so effect or short polarization lifetime. Effectively, what you're doing is storing the polarization in the carbon-13 and pushing it over into proton for detection. And another example, and we published another paper on this just recently, um, we were interested in doing this uh, for urea, and urea has been used as a sort of perfusion agent. And here, uh, we, we're looking with M polarizing the N15 nucleus and transferring polarization into these spin coupled protons. Now, these protons also exchange with solvent, but it's actually quite slow on the NMR time scale. But in order to make this technique to work, we have to transfer the polarization in packets. We can't do it all at once because we want to acquire a series of images over time. And so we developed a, a, a technique which, um, based on previously published work, actually, which showed that we could. Um, uh, this is direct detection here, and this is indirect detection via the protons. You can get a, a, an increase in sensitivity. How much of that increase is depends on how much polarization you want to turn push over in, in one go. We published a, a paper just recently showing using genetic, uh, optimized pulses, um, we can actually improve the uh, polarization transfer efficiency and also uh, um, improve implementation with a surface coil. The other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of technique um, development is we've been really interested in correlating the um, carbon-13 labeling of the lactate that we observe in vivo with MRI with the underlying uh, biochemistry. And the way we've been doing that is to use mass spectrometry imaging. So essentially what we do is we acquire the MR data and then we rapidly freeze the mouse, the whole mouse, and then section the whole mouse. So this is the T2 weighted proton image, here's the tumor at the top of the, on the flank of the animal. This is the corresponding uh, hyperpolarized C13 labeled lactate image superimposed on this um, uh, water image of tissue anatomy. So that, as I said, we then rapidly freeze and then section. So these are 10 micron sections. And then we use mass spectrometry imaging to image the distribution of carb carbon 13 labeled lactate in the tissue. And the technique we use is called DESI desorption electrospray ionization, where we squirt an ionized solvent raster uh, across the frozen sample, and then essentially sniff the ions coming off using mass spectrometry. And what you see here, this is the carbon-13 lactate map now detected using mass spec. And as you can see, a reasonable correlation with uh, what we see in vivo with MR. And in fact, we, we showed in, of course, this is quite a challenging experiment to do because these are quite thick slices, two millimeters plus, these are 10 micron slices, so it's quite difficult to co-register. Nevertheless, we were able to, in, in multiple animals, to co-register the mass spec images and the uh, in vivo hyperpolarized C13 images and showed statistically a reasonable correlation between the two, given all the caveats that there are in making this correlation. But the interesting thing then is we can ask more detailed questions using the mass spec imaging about what's determining the rate of lactate labeling. Now, we had thought it would be related to lactate pool size, but in fact, that's not the case. So if you look down here, this is a, a mass spec image of carbon-13, sorry, carbon-12 labeled lactate. So this is the endogenous lactate, and it's pretty homogeneously distributed across the uh, tumor. But if we look at the C13 labeled lactate, you see a very inhomogeneous distribution. There is no correlation between the level of uh, lactate labeling and the, the size of the endogenous lactate pool. 
In fact, what it correlates with is the, um, the level of uh, labeled pyruvate. So there's clearly a, a perfusion aspect to this that is determining the rate of lactate labeling and not the lactate pool size. And I'll come back to mass spec imaging later. So what are the potential clinical applications of, uh, of using uh, hyperpower IC13 labeled substrates? And as I said, we focused on um, pyruvate. Uh, and, and the most obvious one obviously is in tumors, and we and others, particularly UCSF, for example, have shown this. Um, and we've been working on uh, breast cancer, and here you see a conventional proton image. Here is the tumor just here. If we inject hyperpolarized pyruvate, you see pyruvate appear within the uh, tumor, and then you also see subsequent labeling of lactate, and that labeled lactate appears in the tumor. So what can we do with this? Well, what we showed in this paper, um, perhaps not surprisingly, that there was a correlation between lactate labeling and tumor grade. So the triple negative, more aggressive tumors showed higher levels of lactate labeling than the ER positive, the more indolent, uh, uh, less aggressive tumors, where we see very low levels of lactate labeling. And we also showed that the level of lactate labeling correlates with the expression of the monocarboxylate transporters. These are the transporters that transport pyruvate into the cell and, and lactate out and also with lactate dehydrogenase activity. So the two, uh, two proteins responsible for this labeling of, of lactate, as they increase in expression in the tumor, we see as a consequence more lactate labeling. Now, I, now I don't think this is a great experiment. To, I mean, you're not gonna determine tumor grade, certainly in breast cancer uh, using this technique. What I think the real application is, is in detecting treatment response. And as I said at the beginning, that's really been the focus of my lab's work is to develop techniques that give very, very early indication of response to drug treatment, maybe within 24, 48 hours. And I'm going to show you some, uh, some more examples. This is where we started right at the beginning. We showed that uh, this is, uh, again, this is a uh, false color image of tissue anatomy, um, sorry, the grayscale uh, image of tissue anatomy. This is a false color image of lactate labeling or the rate of lactate labeling. This is in an untreated tumor, and this is 24 hours after treatment. You see a profound decrease in lactate labeling. And, and we understood uh, at the time the, what was underlying this um, loss of lactate labeling, loss of coenzyme concentration, loss of LDH activity, and so on. And we showed in, in multiple different tumor types and using different types of drug that you almost invariably see a decrease in lactate labeling post-drug treatment, and often very early post-drug treatment. And we and others have, have shown this now. In, in multiple examples. More recently, we've done this in the clinic in, in breast cancer, where we can see again, uh, post-treatment, uh, uh, within days of treatment, we see a loss of, of lactate labeling. So preclinically and clinically, we've demonstrated the technique will detect early evidence of treatment response. And as I said, we, the aim is to use this to guide treatment in individual patients. Now, of course, there is already a tech, technique in the clinic, which is very good at doing this, and that's FEG-PET. Um, uh, uh, and this is, this is sort of, for me, this study is sort of a poster child for, uh, for using FEG-PET for therapy monitoring. This is not our data, but I almost invariably show this, uh, these images because they're such a graphic illustration of why it's good to do functional imaging. So here you see a conventional CT image of a patient with a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, this is before and after treatment with a targeted drug. There is no, no evidence that this patient's responding to treatment because the tumor is actually getting bigger. But if you do the FDG PET image, which is a metabolic image uh, uh, of looking at glucose uptake, I'll come back to that later, you can see the tumor is uh, FDG avid prior to treatment and post-treatment, you see a, a profound decrease in FDG uptake. So this functional image is, is detecting response. The drug is hitting its target, doesn't necessarily tell you of outcome, which we don't get that information from the anatomical image. So if we are gonna take this polarized pyruvate into the clinic, we've got to find examples. We've got to find cases where it's gonna um, um, do something better than FDG PET. If FDG PET works very well and it does, and it's already in the clinic. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples where we've shown that the polarized pyruvate experiment will detect response where we don't see anything with FDG PET. And I should preface this by saying, I'm not saying this is better than FDG PET, I think it's complementary, uh, uh, but it is important that we find examples where it will work, where otherwise, why would you bother using it if FDG PET works so well? The first example is slightly artificial. These are uh, um, colorectal tumors implanted subcutaneously. And what we've shown 
is in the first 24 hours after treatment, you see no change in tumor size. So anatomical imaging would not detect any response within the first 24 hours. But within that first 24 hours, if you do histology, you can show that post, and we use the trail agonist, by the way, uh, to, to do these studies. Um, you see a lot of cell death uh, 24 hours, even though the tumor hasn't started to shrink. Uh, we use the, 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 the cells were um, trans, transfected to express uh, luciferase, so we see some decrease in ATP content reflected in the decrease in bioluminescence signal. So the tumor is responding to treatment within 24 hours, but we're not seeing any change in tumor size at this particular point. Now in this, this somewhat artificial situation, we then ask the question, well, can we detect response with FDG PET and can we re detect response with polarized pyruvate? So this is the, um, the polarized pyruvate experiment. And what you see here is lactate labeling pre and post treatment. And you do indeed see a decrease in lactate labeling at 24 hours uh, post-treatment. If we do the FDG PET experiment, we don't really see a significant or consistent change in, in FDG uptake. And so of course the question is, well, why is that? Why does the polarized pyruvate experiment detect response in, in this situation where FDG PET doesn't show anything? So the first thing that we were concerned about, you get this so-called flare phenomenon with FDG PET, that you know, post-treatment, there may be a big increase in uh, uh, immune cell uh, infiltration, macrophage infiltration, and that this may be masking, that the, the FDG uptake by the, the macrophages may be masking any uh, decrease uptake in the tumor cells. So we disaggregated these tumors, uh, flow sorted them, and then counted the uh, radioactivity in these different fractions. And what you can see from this study is that the phagocytes take up about 10 times more FDG than the tumor cells, but they're such a minor component in these particular tumors that they're not contributing to what we see. So why, why would the FDG PET experiment show something, uh, not show anything, and the PARV experiment show something? So it's worth just considering what you're measuring in these experiments. So with FDG PET, we're looking at the delivery of a glucose analog, uptake on the glucose transporters, which are frequently upregulated in tumors, and phosphorylation and trapping uh, in this reaction catalyzed by hexakinase. So essentially three steps, delivery, transport, and phosphorylation. Pyruvate really is only looking at three steps too. It's looking at delivery, uptake on the monica boxylate transport, and then it exchanges its um, label with the, the um, lactate pool. Now, although I've given you an example where lactate pool wasn't affecting the amount of signal we see, there are examples where, where it does. And so if you decrease the lactate pool size in here, in this example, you will see de decreased um, lactate labeling. And then so in, in fact, the FDG, uh, the pyruvate experiment is more sensitive to flux through the entire glycolytic pathway because it also depends on the lactate uh, pool size. And we demonstrated this actually using non-polarized carbon-13 labeled glucose to show that there was a decrease in glycolytic flux in that first 24 hours. And that's actually shown just here. So that explains in this instance why we're seeing something with pyruvate and we're not seeing anything with FDG, somewhat artificial. Now this next example I think is, is somewhat more interesting. Um, we were interested in, you know, uh, so patients with ER positive breast cancers are treated with PI3 kinase inhibitors. And these are several of these are in, in clinical trial. And we had a very simple minded hypothesis that if we use a PI3 kinase inhibitor, we'll knock down the expression of HIF1 alpha and MYC now, these two transcription factors, so HIF will drive the expression, or a, a membrane expression of the glucose transport of GLUT1. It also drives the expression of hexakinase, and it also drives the expression of lactate dehydrogenase, the enzyme that catalyzes exchange of label between pyruvate and lactate. Similarly, MYC does pretty much the same thing. It drives the expression of the glucose transport, also hexakinase, and again, lactate dehydrogenase. So our hypothesis was if we use a PI3 kinase inhibitor in these ER positive breast cancer cells and tumors, PDXs, then we'll see a decrease in FDG uptake and we'll see a decrease in lactate labeling. So we started using um, patient-derived uh, xenografts. So this is uh, ER positive PIK3CA mutant tumor, it's drug sensitive. And 24 hours after treatment, we see a decrease in lactate labeling. So we're seeing a very early indication of treatment response. If we take a triple negative, which is PIK3CA wild type, we see no change in lactate labeling. So we can detect res responsive tumors and resistant tumors. And we worked on many different models, but I'm gonna focus on one particular model. Again, slightly artificial, but we saw consistently saw the same thing in multiple models. So you can make uh, ER positive tumors um, 
drug resistant by knocking out P10, either knocking it down or, or knocking it out. So we CRISPR'd it out or we knocked it down with shRNA. Uh, and, and so this is, these are T47Ds where we've knocked out P10 or knocked it down. And this is the imaging protocol. We get a baseline image, we then three treatments, and then we uh, uh, post-treatment imaging. So we're looking for very early indication of treatment response. And indeed we did see that. So in drug sensitive um, tumors, uh, post-treatment, we saw really quite a substantial decrease in lactate labeling. Um, in the knockouts, so these are drug resistant, we see no change in lactate labeling. If we do FGG PET in these same tumors, uh, we see no change post-treatment, either in the controls or in the drug resistant tumors. And so why is that? Well, if, if, we, if we look at this Western blot data, what you see here is when we drug treat in the sensitive um, tumors, you see no change in hexakinase, and actually it's not shown here, no change in glucose transporters, but you see quite a profound decrease in lactate dehydrogenase expression. If we take the, uh, uh, the drug resistant tumors, then there's no change in LDH. So we have a mechanistic explanation for why we see a change in lactate labeling and why we don't really see any change in FDG uptake. So our simple-minded hypothesis turned out to be wrong. So uh, HIF1 alpha and MYC are not knocked down. If we use a PI3 kinase inhibitor uh, in drug sensitive cells, we don't see a change in HIF or MYC, and nor do we see that obviously in the drug resistance uh, tumors either. The transcription factor that we do see knocked down though is FOXM1. And we see quite a profound decrease in FOXM1. And what we showed subsequently in these tumors is that FOXM1 drives the expression of lactate dehydrogenase. And you can see that here. So we use an shRNA to knock down FOXM1 and you see a decrease in LDHA expression. So not HIF, not MYC, they're not changing. In this tumor, in ER positive breast cancer, it's FOXM1. And we show subsequently that FOXM1 seems to be intimately involved in the drug resistance uh, phenotype. And just to, so to summarize this then, um, uh, the mechanism, what we're looking at, if we have a drug sensitive uh, tumor, we in the, in it, the PI3 kinase inhibitor inhibits the phosphorylation of FOXO3A. FOXO3A then goes into the nucleus, and you can see that in this uh, histological stain here, where you see the uh, protein go into the nucleus. It blocks the expression of FOXM1, and therefore we get a decrease in lactate dehydrogenase activity, and we see a decrease in lactate labeling. In, in a drug resistant tumor, we see phosphorylation of FOXO3A, it stays in the cytoplasm, this is post-drug treatment, and therefore FOXM1 is then increased in expression, we get increased in, in LDHA, and we therefore see sustained lactate labeling in the drug resistant tumor. So we have a mechanistic, we have a biomarker effectively of FOXM1, a transcription factor which is intimately involved in, in, in resistance and sensitivity to the PI3 kinase inhibitor, and we don't see anything with FDG PET. Now, as I said, we're not, I'm not suggesting it replaces FDG PET, but this is another example where it will detect response where FDG PET won't. So I want to talk about another tumor now and we'll probably spend the rest of the talk on this is glioblastoma. Again, uh, we studied um, patient-derived xenografts in, implanted orthotopically, uh, 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 intracranially. You see these two are really quite well demarcated PDXs. This is a very diffuse uh, tumor and it infiltrates most of the brain. If we inject polarized pyruvate, we see lactate labeling in these tumors. In this diffuse tumor, the whole brain seems to, to light up. What interested us was that it was very clear that different PDXs show different amounts of lactate labeling. So this GB4 shows high levels of lactate labeling, whereas this tumor GB1 shows no more lactate labeling than the surrounding uh, brain tissue. We did uh, genome sequencing in all of these, and there wasn't anything obvious that most of them have PI3 kinase mutations, uh, most of them had lost P10, some of them had P53 mutations. There was nothing specifically that we could pin down to their genomic profile, although subsequent RNA sequencing data indicates that GB4 is a mesenchymal type tumor, whereas GB1 is a neuroprogenitor like uh, tumor. Um, so what is the, what's driving this difference in lactate labeling in GB4 versus GB1? Well, in this tumor, in contrast to what we saw in ER positive uh, breast cancers, it's MYC. So GB4 has high levels of MYC, which drives the expression in this tumor of LDHA and also hexakinase. And it also drives the membrane expression of the MCTs. So GB4 has high levels of membrane expression of the MCTs. 
is this really the mechanism that's working in vivo? Well, what we did was go back into patients, did multi-region sampling in, in individual tumors. So these are, um, oh, I seem to have frozen. So these, these are four different patients and um, sampled different regions of their tumors where you see quite variation in hexakinase between different regions uh, in, in all four patients. Um, and the same with MYC. We see quite a variation in MYC expression across these uh, individual tumors. But what we see very clearly is a very good correlation between hexakinase and MYC expression in these different regions. So in essence, then these tumors are very heterogeneous. We see heterogeneous MYC expression and as a consequence, heterogeneous expression of LDHA and hexakinase. So what we've asked more recently is this metabolic variation that we see in the PDXs, do we also see that in the patients. So this is again using polarized pyruvate uh, in, a, in, in GBMs. Now it's, it's a very limited study, I will admit, there's only um, seven patients, so it's somewhat anecdotal. But nevertheless, in patients one and patient six, we saw similar lactate labeling to what we saw in GB4. So high levels of lactate labeling and higher than we see in the surrounding uh, brain tissue. Uh, and whereas other tumors look more, more like um, GB1, uh, where we see a much more oxidative uh, activity. In order to better understand this un the, un the biology that's underlying these metabolic differences, again, we've turned to mass spec imaging. So we take the animals, we infuse them with carbon-13 labeled glucose, obviously non-polarized. We, for a couple of hours, we then uh, uh, curl and section, fr rapidly freeze and then section the brains of these animals. And what you can see, GB1, this is the one that showed low levels of lactate labeling with hyperpolarized pyruvate, uh, shows high levels of succinate, fumarate, malate labeling. So these are the TCA cycle intermediates. So this tumor has uh, high levels of um, TCA cycle activity, whereas GB4, this is the one that showed high levels of lactate labeling with polarized pyruvate, really doesn't show much TCA cycle activity. And we see the same thing reflected in oxygen consumption data with the cells in, in culture. GB4 also shows more lactate labeling uh, than, from glucose than, than GB1. So and I, I've called this a new approach to metabolic imaging. It, it's actually not. Um, it's um, using deuterium. Um, many of us played around with deuterium in the 1990s. Um, it didn't really go very far at that time because deuterium is a very unattractive nucleus for magnetic resonance experiments. It's really very insensitive to detection. It's got a very compressed frequency spread in the, the spectra show very compressed frequency spread because um, it's got a much lower uh, gamma than, uh, than proton. And the, the resonances are also broadened because it's a, a quadrupolar uh, nucleus. So crowded spectra, not very sensitive. Why would we ever bother with deuterium? Well, this quadrupolar property also means it has very short T1 relaxation time which means you can um, acquire data very rapidly without saturating the signal. So you can make up for this lack of sensitivity by just rapid uh, signal averaging. And the, this, is, this paper was from Robin de Graff's lab at Yale. And, and I think it's a landmark paper and I'll, I'll explain why. So th they took um, rats with um, uh, orthotopically implanted uh, glioblastoma. They then acquired uh, local, uh, images of uh, labeled water, glucose, and glutamate glutamine. Now in the tumor, they could see labeled lactate, whereas in the surrounding brain tissue, they saw labeling of glutamate glutamine. And this is an indicator of TCA cycle activity because as glutamate glutamine becomes labeled via alpha ketoglutarate in the TCA cycle. So if you look at the glucose image, you see high levels of glucose in the brain, much less in the tumor. If you look at the glutamate glutamine labeling, low in the tumor, so low TCA cycle activity, much higher in the surrounding brain tissue. And if you look at the lactate limit image, it's high in the tumor and uh, much lower in the sur uh, surrounding brain tissue. So this is actually a, a, glia, um, a C6 glioblastoma um, you know, rat model. Uh, and if you take the lactate glutamate glutamine ratio, then you have a sort of indicator of the Warburg effect, uh, which is this sort of aerobic glycolysis. So the tumor is showing aerobic glycolysis. It's a landmark paper because they did the experiment in patients as well. Uh, and they got the patients to drink um, de deuterium labeled uh, glucose. And you can quite clearly see in the tumor, in, in these glioblastoma patients, high levels of lactate labeling in the tumor. Well, I was really very excited by this um, study. 
unlike with carbon 13 where we push to get it into the clinic we don't have to push now it's already in the clinic so uh, the rationale for doing these studies is already established what we did instead of acquiring a long time and getting high resolution images we acquired very rapid images in uh, over a period of five minutes or so so you see a series of images here where we've uh, injected deuterium labeled glucose so in these glucose images, you can see the glucose actually rapidly goes into the, uh, into the bladder. This is the corresponding lactate image, and you can see lactate actually accumulates in the tumor, which is at the top of the image here. Now, the beauty of deuterium as well is you have a built-in standard. Before we inject this deuterated glucose, the natural abundance deuterium in water uh, or the deuterium, natural abundance of deuterium on this planet means that the amount of deuterium in water is about equivalent of about 13 to 14 millimolar. What that means is we, can, we have a built-in standard. We can convert all our signal intensities into concentrations. And that's what's shown here. This color scale is in millimolar. What we did then was to fit the glucose signals and the lactate signals to a model of the glycolytic pathway and could convert these data then into fluxes, into maps of metabolic flux. So this is a map of glycolysis in this tumor in millimolar per minute. And this is before and 24 hours after drug treatment. We see again this profound loss of glucose flux. So again, another method of detecting treatment response. Now, um, I didn't, this, uh, I'm going to talk about one more substrate and, and, and finish. Now, I've really been focused on imaging cell death uh, using MR right, right from uh, since I first came to Cambridge. It turns out to be quite difficult to image cell death, but we showed some years ago that you can use hyperpolar IC13 labeled fumarate. Now fumarate uh, is converted into malate in this reaction catalyzed by fumarase, which is predominantly a mitochondrial enzyme. Now, what we found was that in viable cells, certainly viable tumor cells, fumarate is taken up very slowly and you don't see any malate produced. But when a cell becomes necrotic, the enzyme can leak out or conversely fumarate can get into the cell very easily. Now, this is a simple hydration reaction. You don't need a coenzyme, you just need water. And fumarase is an extremely active enzyme. So you see malate produce. Essentially, fumarase activity is a beacon of cell death in this experiment. So we used hyperpolar IC13 labeled fumarate. You can see fumarate here in this image. You can see a bit of malate because there's always a bit of uh, cell death in tumors pre-treatment. But post-treatment, we saw a big increase in malate production. What we've discovered more recently, you can do exactly the same experiment with deuterated fumarate. And the reason is, is the deuterium signals from fumarate and malate are really well separated. And what we showed is you can image this. Uh, this is pretreatment. This is the fumarate image. This is the malate image. You see very little malate pretreatment. But post-treatment, we see a big increase in malate production. This is the same experiment we did here with C13. We're now doing with deuterium. And what we showed was a very good correlation between the level, the malate fumarate ratio and the degree of cell death determined histologically. But what I want to draw your attention to is look at the contrast here. We're seeing an enormous increase in the malate fumarate ratio, whereas we saw really a, quite a small increase in the polar IC13 experiment. And I, I'll explain that why in a minute. So although the sensitivity of label detection is less, the contrast is much greater. And what we've been doing more recently is to look at these, um, patient-derived xenografts, these GBM uh, models again, and I've already talked about them, GB4 and GB1, and it turns out that GB4 is radiation resistant. GB1 is very radiation sensitive, and this is the protocol that we use. So we do, a, it sort of simulates a clinical uh, treatment protocol using temozolomide and targeted radiation, uh, and then we image at, uh, two days after the completion of radiation treatment with um, deuterated fumarate, hyperpolarized fumarate. You, we also use uh, contrast agent enhanced MRI and diffusion weighted imaging, which have both been used clinically to detect response to radiotherapy in, in GBM, uh, usually post-resection. So this is what we, 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 what we see here is that this is pre and post treatment. Uh, so we see fumarate, we see malate. Uh, we, this is the fumarate signal, this is the malate signal. Uh, notice in this, um, uh, this is actually GB, sorry, this is GB1, I've mislabeled this. You see an increase in malate signal, uh, pre-treatment, post-treatment, you see a big increase in, in malate uh, labeling. And that's reflected in these uh, spectra here. And you can image, 
So, um, so this is GB4, this is the radiation resistant one. We see a much more modest increase in the malate fumarate ratio as compared to GB1, where we see a really large increase in the, the malate fumarate ratio. Uh, U87 is a, a, a cell line model. And you, as again, you can see that very clearly in the imaging. So post-treatment, we see an increase in malate labeling, which is actually much larger in, in GB1, which is more radiosensitive. And so we compared it with the hyperpolarized um, uh, C13 labeled fumarate experiment, uh, although we have much better signal to noise in, in these spectra, but we see a much more modest change in the malate fumarate ratio. And really that's no surprise, because if you think about the time course of labeling, in the polarized C13 experiment, we're looking at these first few minutes. We can only follow, the polarization lifetime is so short, we can only follow it for a few, few minutes. Whereas with the deuterium experiment, we actually follow, we integrate all that melee accumulation over a period of an hour or so. So we get much better contrast with the deuterium experiment. And as I said, we compared it with diffusion-weighted MRI. Uh, we don't really see any change in, uh, in, diffu in the DWI or the water ADC in the GB4, which is radiation resistant. Um, we do see something in the radiation sensitive GB1. We see after but seven days after treatment, much later. So with fumarate, we're seeing big response within uh, 48 hours. And this U87, again, we saw some evidence of response from DWI. And using contrast agent enhancement, similar story. Uh, in the radiation resistant GB4, we see some evidence of an increase in uh, contrast agent enhancement but a bigger one nevertheless in, um, in the more sensitive, radio sensitive GB1, and again, much lower in the U87 model. So I, I guess what I'm saying here, and the changes are quite modest actually, we're seeing really big change in that malate fume rate ratio. It's a very sensitive way of detecting cell death. Uh, and the, the really remarkable thing is um, hitherto we've, in, we've injected the fume rate intravenously, what we found is you can administer it orally as well, just oral gavage and you get the same sort of contrast. And so this is again showing post-treatment, we see a big increase in the malate fume rate ratio, similar to what we saw with IV injection. So I, the sort of vision for this, I think, is potentially your, your patient, your GBM patient can go for radiotherapy, um, post-radiotherapy a day or two days later, drink some fume rate in the radiology department, and we think you should be able to detect whether there's any cell. And it's quite difficult to do it. There's this phenomenon of pseudo progression where you can see the tumor actually getting bigger, even though it's responding to treatment. We think the fumarate experiment potentially could be used to detect response where, where it's difficult to detect response with conventional MR methods. So just to summarize then, I started talking about more about technology. You've got to do fast imaging because the, the polar, for C, the hyperpolarized C13 because the polarization lifetime is so short. I talked about using pyruvate for therapy monitoring. I gave you some examples where pyruvate uh, can work better than FDG. I'm not suggesting that it will replace FDG in the clinic, but it's clearly complementary. And I gave you a couple of examples. Um, and the most interesting was the breast cancer PDX is where we see a response to PI3 kinase inhibitors uh, with polarized pyruvate where we don't with FDG. And importantly, we understand the mechanism behind that. I talked about glioma PDX is where we see CMIC is driving um, uh, the, the, the differences in metabolism that we see. And the differences in metabolism that we saw in the PDXs, we, we're beginning to see in the patients as well. And then finally, I talked about using deuterium MRI where you can use deuterated glucose to image glycolytic flux. I, I actually get real maps of the, uh, glycolytic flux. And then I talked uh, finally about fumarate detecting cell death. And just, just to finish, um, some acknowledgements. A whole host of people have been involved both clinically and preclinically. Um, I'd just like to point out the collaborators, Carlos Caldas, that we worked with on the breast PDXs, Colin Watts on the um, GBM PDXs, uh, Richard Goodwin and Greg Hamm, and many others actually involved in the Rosetta project, uh, the Grand Challenge project. We, we collaborated with them on the mass spec imaging. And as a whole host of people involved on the clinical studies and particularly in knowledge of Radio Gallagher, who did his PhD with me and is now leading on the um, uh, work in radiology. So um, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brindley, for the great talk. Uh, uh, now we have time for some questions. I think I have three questions in the Q&A box. Uh, can I read it? 
the first question is uh, from uh, Phil Adamson. I think, can you comment on the potential clinical significance of pyruvate delivery? I am familiar with the Warber effect looking at lactate flux, but if the C13 is more strongly correlated with pyruvate delivery than lactate concentration, how yeah. should we interpret what we are looking at the third, uh, C13 imaging as it relates to cancer metabolism? Yeah, so it's a good question. And that's why I showed at the very beginning why we've been using mass spec imaging. So that in that particular tumor, it's quite clear that the degree of um, lactate labeling is not correlating in that tumor with lactate pool size. It's correlating, uh, certainly correlates with pyruvate delivery to the tumor. If I take the breast cancer PDXs, there we can quite clearly see if we, if we reduce LDH activity, we see a decrease in lactate labeling. So um, I think, you know, what we see in terms of labeling is obviously dependent on multiple parameters. It's dependent on perfusion, it's dependent on transport, pyruvate transport, and it's dependent on um, uh, LDH activity, which is also related to the lactate um, pool size. Now, some people have published to say it's all monocarboxylate transporter activity. I, that's, it may be in some tumors. It's, we did a, a flux control analysis in, in, in a tumor. We published this in JBC some years ago. And what we showed is the degree of control varies between, will be different between different tumors. So the extent to which perfusion affects what you see, of course it will. If pyruvate didn't get there, you're not going to see anything, but it's not the only factor. So both transport activity and the LDH, and that will vary between different tumor types. But as I said, in the breast cancer PDX is clearly knocking down LDH activity with the PIQ kinase inhibitor reduce the degree of lactate labeling. Thank you. Uh, the second question is from uh, Petris Mellin. Do the mouse need corticosteroids? Patient do, which may change metabolic patterns. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good, good point. Um, I think that lactate labeling is very, very sensitive to lots of different things. And, and it's really a reflection of the interconnectedness, the scale-free nature of metabolic networks. Like all biological networks, it's scale-free. It's held together. The whole network's held together by the coenzymes. They're evolutionarily ancient. What that means is if you perturb the metabolic network anyway, you almost invariably see a change in NAD and ADH ratio, and that will then translate into a change in the rate of lactate labeling. And in, in some cases, in, in response to some drugs, you actually see an increase in, in lactate labeling. So yes, I think any, any intervention, and according to steroids would be a good example, you would expect that to have some effect on the degree of lactate labeling, but you would do, you, you, yeah. So I, I it, that's something that would have to be considered. I mean, the, the, the model is, is that you do a baseline image, what we envisage, you do a baseline image, and then within 24, 48 hours after you drug treat, then you image again uh, in, a, in a, an effort to look at re response to that, that particular drug. And so in fact, in with the breast cancer um, PDXs, we are now trying to set up a clinical trial where we will look within 48 hours of treatment whether those patients are indeed responding to the drug. Thank you. Uh, the another question from uh, Parak. Can you please comment on the chicken egg problem of the hypoxia causing metabolic changes versus endogenous metabolic changes leading to less recruitment of vasculature yeah. leading to hypoxia? Yeah, like that's another good question. So let me tell you, I didn't talk about this in, in any detail. Um, so I talked about those GBMs of the PDXs, GB1 and GB4. Now GB4 is this mesenchymal-like subtype, RNA-seq data. In the, it actually is constitutively um, hypoxic in the sense that it has high levels of HIF, regardless of uh, the degree of tumor hypoxia. So the the re, so I, I said it's MIC driven. It's also probably HIF driven as well. That tumor has low has low TCA cycle activity, has constitutively high levels of HIF, regardless of the presence of oxygen. So if you look at those cells in culture in 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 vitro with high oxygen tension, they maintain high levels of HIF. They maintain low levels of TCA cycle activity. So uh, yeah, and of course hypoxia 
is going is it will have an impact on, on what you see because it will raise the expression of lactate dehydrogenase it will raise the expression of the glucose transporters it will make it more glycolytic and of course that will have have an impact yeah yeah uh, i think no more question i have a few questions uh, the first one is uh, i think most of your tumor models are uh, pdx tumors uh, like uh, in uh, immunodeficient mice right yeah have you ever noticed like a kind of what, what kind of changes if you do the same in uh, some syngenic model or in real human patient? Yeah, so we we okay. The, the the let me answer that. So first of all, we we actually before we were using PDXs, we were using gems. So we actually used the gem model of pancreatic cancer and showed that we could detect tumor progression. It's a KPC mouse or KC mouse. We actually use this is the um, raspberry. So. Um, I actually, the reason I like the PDXs is that they reflect the, the genomic heterogeneity that one sees in the patients themselves. Mm -hmm. And what I think is remarkable is that in those GBM PDXs, we are seeing similar metabolism in vivo now, which we've infused patients with carbon-13 labeled glucose. We're doing mass spec imaging. We've already done the hyperpolarized C13 labeled pyruvate, and we see the same sort of metabolic phenotypes that we see in the PDX as we are beginning to see in the patients. So in that respect, I, yeah, I, of course, you're right. I mean, they are, they're immunocompromised. Um, nevertheless, I mean, you know, um, you know, all models are bad, but some are useful, right? I mean, yeah. so you have to, you have to, the, the, the advantage of them from my perspective is, as I said, they reproduce this genomic heterogeneity of the parent tumors. And therefore, if you're interested in, and they, that, that genomic heterogeneity translates into a metabolic heterogeneity as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question, if I'm right, I think uh, one of your hypotheses uh, for the post-treatment uh, low uptake for FTG is due to like a kind of lot of immune cells recruitment and the macrophages. Yeah, no, what, what I was trying to say there was that, I mean, one one potential reason why we wouldn't see a decrease in FDG uptake in the tumor as a whole was mm -hmm. because macrophages were flooding in and were taking up lots of FDG. Yeah. That in in those particular models that doesn't seem to be the case because yeah. although the macrophages take up ten times more FDG, they're such a minor fraction, less than two percent of the total. Um, I mean, I didn't I did I went over that quite quickly that the tumor cells were also labeled with red fluorescent protein so we could sort tumor cells and, and we sorted the, the, the phagocytes using cell surface markers and then counted all the fractions so in that particular tumor we don't see this sort of flare effect where, mm -hmm. where you would see increased FDG uptake which may mask any decrease in FDG uptake in the tumors that doesn't seem to be the case okay, okay. thank you uh, if any other question from audience there's one in the chat. It's how about uh, breast yeah, cancer? How about the breast cancer to live liver cancer. metastases? Uh, yeah, um, we, I'm not quite sure what the question is. If you're asking the question, would you detect metastases in the liver? My guess is uh, probably yes. Um, it, 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 I suppose it depends on how. Um, how a good, I mean, yeah, I don't, yeah, triple negatives. I'm, I'm pretty confident you would because they're so glycolytic and they're so they show high levels of lactate labeling. ER positive, um, I don't know. They show much lower levels of lactate labeling. I should actually add that all those studies that we did in response to, um, uh, in response to the PI3 kinase inhibitors, that was all done ER positive tumors, which show relatively low levels of lactate labeling. And despite that, we were still able to detect response. Uh, yeah, the question: Can you monitor the treatment yeah, of such metastases? Yeah, I, I'm sure. I, I, I mean, I, I absolutely. I, I can't see any reason why that wouldn't be possible. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, there is no more question. I really kind of appreciate your uh, great talk and uh, all the audience uh, once again. Thank you so much. Yep, thanks very much. Thank you. Bye, -bye. bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.